Hello, everybody, and welcome to another night of Ocean Geographic Live, this time for World Oceans Week, which is, of course, our favorite week of the year. Um, today, we are going to be chatting with Dr. Jonathan Balcombe, who wrote a fantastic book that I hope you all get a chance to read called What a Fish Knows. Yay! Um, let me, before we get going, though, tell you a little bit about Jonathan, and then we'll get to some questions. So, um, Jonathan is a biologist with a PhD in ethology, the study of animal behavior. His books include Pleasurable Kingdom, Second Nature, The Exultant Ark, and What a Fish Knows, a New York Times bestseller now available in 16 languages. His latest book for grownups, Superfly, won the 2021 National Outdoor Book Award for Natural History Literature. He also has a children's storybook called Jake and Ava, A Boy and a Fish, which was published late last year. Before focusing on writing books, Jonathan worked for several animal protection organizations, a medical technology firm, and as a professional editor. Jonathan has appeared in several films and television programs, including the 2021 film Seaspiracy and the 2021 documentary on the aquarium fish trade, The Dark Hobby. He lives in Southern Ontario, where in his spare time, he enjoys biking, baking, birding, bach, and trying to understand the neighborhood squirrels, of course. <laughs> well, welcome, Jonathan. Thank you so much for sharing your time with us. Thank you, Alex. Great to be here. Really appreciate it. Um, so first of all, where are you coming from right now? Tell us where you're at. <laughs> I'm in a town of about 50,000 called Belleville, Ontario. It's on Bay of Quinte, which is part of Lake Ontario. Lots of nature nearby. It's about two hours drive east of Toronto. Okay, very cool. Well, you're close to water, so that's always good. <laughs> always. <laughs> all right. So um, as has already a little bit been covered, um, you've had quite a diverse background. Um, so for everybody watching, um, please tell us kind of how you found your way to this current place in life, um, as well as your inspiration behind writing What a Fish Knows. I've always loved animals from my earliest memory. I think it's partly genetic, but also probably partly environmental. My parents also love animals. And so that obviously rubs off on me. Although I like to think I rubbed off more on them than, than they on me in that, in that okay. regard. Uh, as for fishes, I, I love writing about animals that are in particular, uh, there's good science about them. Uh, it's showing amazing abilities that people and people underestimate them and fishes qualify on those two counts in big time. Uh, yeah. We've sort of relegated them to the cellar of, of vertebrate life and they don't deserve to be there. Uh, and also if, if we malign them, that's even makes them even more of an appealing topic, appealing topic to me and and people in the, uh, listening to this call probably know that we take a lot of fishes out of the oceans every year. And yeah. there may be only about 50,000, 50%, sorry, 50% left of the ones, you know, in the last 50 years, we may have lost about half of all marine life, including fishes. So, you know, they're in trouble. And that's another reason for me to want to write about them to try and improve our relations with them. Yeah, no, it's, it's a wonderful book and really touches on so many interesting things that even as someone who spends tons of time talking about fish that I didn't even know. Um, and as scientists, I know everyone tends to always shy away from talking about emotions and things like that, that anthropomorphize animals, but you don't, which I love, um, but that's because there is science behind it. So you write about fish showing emotion. So can you give us some examples of what fish emotion looks like? There's certainly basic evidence for, for fun, basic emotions like fear and rage and lust. Uh, but a, a mind-blowing study that I encountered during my research into the, the book was a study published about a decade ago. Uh, researchers from the University of Lisbon collected surgeon fishes from uh, the Great Barrier Reef, about 30 of them, and they stressed them. Being caught and taken in, into captivity, they're already very stressed, and you can measure the stress by taking a blood sample and measuring cortisol, uh, the stress hormone. And so these were unhappy fishes. And uh, then they put them, each one of them, they stressed them further by putting them in a, in a, in a shallow bucket of water for 30 minutes. Uh, and then they were divided into two groups and each fish went alone into a tank. One, uh, the experimental tank had a model of a cleaner ras, which is a fish that delivers services, remo parasite removal services on the, on the reef. That's a whole other story in itself that involves <laughs> Machiavellian intelligence and emotions and such. Um, and, and so all the fish went in and had, a, there was this model in the tank uh, and the fish went individually in the tank. And in the experimental, the, the 
little model cleaner rasp was hooked up to a motor so it could give it moved in a waving motion and could deliver gentle caresses and the other one the control was uh, no no motor so the met rasp just sat there still and couldn't deliver caresses that's significant because the ones in the first group the, the stressed surgeon fish would swim up to that model and get strokes and mm -hmm. Scientists measure stuff. So on an average, over an hour session, they the stressed fish would get would go up and make contact with that stroke and get strokes 15 times an hour. Mm -hmm. And in the uh, control group, zero times an hour. It couldn't mm -hmm. deliver strokes. And they also measured the stress during these experiments of the hormone. And uh, the f fishes in the first group who could get caresses, their stress levels came down mm -hmm. back towards baseline much faster. The other ones remained stressed. That, to me, is, is a remarkable I mean, I'm glad I wasn't a fish in the study, but it's certainly <laughs> right. a, a powerful, def, uh, you know, demonstration of a level of, compl of emotional complexity that we don't typically associate with fishes. I'm happy to say that the scientists did release them back into the, the original spots on the reef, and all the fishes survived the unpleasant uh, study. That is very good. Um, I do really appreciate you in the book. Um, I, I actually did a reread last week because I hadn't read it since it came out, um, that you always mention sort of the treatment of the animals in the studies that you mention, And it's like, this is what's gone on. This is how it was done. These were harmed. These were not. It's it's just very helpful when kind of evaluating what you're looking at. Um, well, I know that's that important background. to me. And, and I it is. And I am kind of an advocate of, of, of all animals. So that's that's an important part of the whole message for me. Yeah, no, it's it's useful information to have. Um, so in addition to people probably being surprised that fish can demonstrate emotion, uh, they're also surprisingly vocal. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about sound production and possibly some communication in fish? Yeah, I think part of the problem here is what, what we think they're silent because uh, when right. they make sounds underwater, we don't hear it just as if we stick our head in a in a bottle, in a pool and shout, we're not heard by people ab above in the air. <laughs> it's just a, you know, it's a different medium. Uh, but underwater fishes have many, many ways of communicating acoustically. They don't have sort of vocal cords like we do per se, but they have, a, for instance, uh, all, all bony fish have a, a swim bladder, mm -hmm. which is a, a chamber of gas. And it's, it's probably evolved primarily for buoyancy and controlling flotation, a very useful adaptation, but it's also been co-opted into a communication device. Fishes can can resonate that. They can Some fishes can rub it against neighboring organs or neighboring bones and create different sounds like that. And then many fishes are actually named for the sounds they make, such as grunts and sea robins and the like. So that's that swim bladder affords a lot of opportunities to make interesting sounds. But fishes don't stop there. Some of them uh, will grind their teeth. Some will grind bones in their mouths and heads and other parts of their body. Uh, so uh, there's many, many ways that they communicate. I, I can't, I, this answer wouldn't be complete without mentioning uh, what I playfully call flatulent communication in herring. They actually have been studied to sh and shown to release bubbles from their rear ends, which makes uh, apparently an audible sound. And they primarily do this at night. And it's thought to be a, a way of communicating somewhat incognito, although I would think predators could cue in on that. Mm -hmm. uh, but anyway, it's an unusual form of communication. It just shows how opportunistic uh, you know, evolution is and, and, and fishes have, are very much part of that process. It's so interesting. And it, it's, you know, it's nice as a scuba diver to be able to experience these sorts of things firsthand. Like I've always been amazed by how vocal damsel fishes are, especially domino damsels. My goodness, you can hear them so far away. And um, they really do not enjoy photographers getting too close to them. Yeah. And uh, they're not shy about letting you know, that's for sure. Yeah, um, that's neat. I haven't heard the. I hadn't even heard of the domino damsel fish. Oh Great yeah, name. they're they're very loud and they yell at each other and us <laughs> underwater all the time. And um, it's it's just really interesting. And uh, yeah, it's all, always nice to read a book that sort of confirms what you've seen and what you kind of know already, but for real. <laughs> so yes. uh, that's that's always nice. Um, all right, so moving on from from sound, um, fish intelligence. Uh, the ways that we tend to measure intelligence are, of course, very human centric. Um, so this leads us to sort of think that non-human animals are unintelligent or they're not smart like us, um, but that's not really the case. So as far as fishes and intelligence goes, can you tell us maybe some of your favorite examples? Yeah, well, I, 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 you know, you make a good point about how we tend to measure intelligence uh, according to human standards. And these are different creatures who've evolved in a, in a different milieu. 
nevertheless, uh, in one intelligence test, a sort of a, a, a food related puzzle and involving different colored plates, one of which was taken away quickly, one which was left, plates of food, the cleaner races in that study learned to eat the food in the temporary and the ephemeral plate first, because mm. it's going to be taken away. They learned that uh, much faster than great apes, chimpanzees, I think were used, yeah, chimpanzees, orangutans, capuchin monkeys, and even one uh, a fish researcher's four-year-old daughter uh, didn't learn it as quickly or as well. Now, there's any kind of number of theories as to why that might be, but, but you know, it, it does illustrate, I think, an important biological phenomenon, and that is that animals are good at what's important to them. Yeah. Cleaner races work on reefs cleaning clients. It helps them to know who came and when, so a little bit of a temporal knowledge. If a fish is addicted to their cleaning services and the spa treatment they get, and it was just there 10 minutes ago, and there's, a, you know, you, you get examples of that, they're not likely to have as many parasites on them, so they're not hmm. going to be as worthwhile plucking things off. You're not going right. to get as much food. So you can see how it's adaptive for a cleaner ras to have a good sense of time and visitation rates and that sort of thing. So that's one one example. Um, what would be another one? Um, I, I made it. Oh yeah, I wanted to mention a study of uh, fascinating communication interspecies that I think certainly speaks to a, a level of awareness that once again we wouldn't typically associate with fishes. Um, Groupers of various species, coral grouper, for instance, will make a head shake, a, a gesture. It's a referential gesture to moray eels, to a specific moray eel, usually because it's that particular moray eel that they've worked with together uh, before. And they, and the moray eel understands the signal as an invitation to go hunting together. And if these two fishes, which have very different hunting styles, groupers out in the open water, and if a fish escapes, the grouper goes into the matrix of the reef. Well, the moray eel can can wiggle in and might get them. So they have a they have a Five, up to five times higher success rate in, in hunting if they collaborate together. So uh, it's called a referential signal, the head shake, because it's referring to a different, a, an activity that's separate in space and time. It's referring. Um, referential communication in, in non-humans is pretty rare and generally regarded as very high, high intelligence. So I have to say that referential, referential communication isn't, isn't very smart, or, or fishes are pretty amazing to be using it. <laughs> right. I prefer the latter interpretation. Yeah, I think so. <laughs> Those are both amazing. I think one of my favorite ones uh, from the book was when you were talking about um, sort of the spatial mapping capacity of some gobies and tide pools where, yeah, like, well, you know. <laughs> Tell people yeah. about that. I love that one. <laughs> sure. It's, it's just the frilfin goby is most yeah. famous for this behavior. They live in the intertidal zone. So the tide pool area at low tide. And then and, and they've been noticed. It's been noticed they can jump accurately from one tide pool to another to escape an octopus or a heron or some other predator. Yeah. A very useful skill. But it begs the question, how do they know which direction to jump? How far? How do they avoid making a leap of faith and ended up stranded on the rocks? Yeah. And it turns out they do that by, by memorizing the tide pool zone at high tide. So a few hours later, the water comes in. They swim down among the nooks and crannies. They get to know that area like the back of their hand, proverbially, <laughs> or their fin, I guess. <laughs> and, and then they use that memory to make it to, uh, even then it's a remarkable um, ability to translate a sort of an aerial view, if you will, into a horizontal view, because they're under these pools at low tide. Yeah. And yet they can do that, a very useful adaptation. It's called mental mapping is the term biologists use. And based on a, a series of captive studies, it, it, they showed that the, an individual fish can learn a tide pool zone in, in one day and can remember it uh, 40 days later, despite no inter, intervening um, experience with that zone so wow uh, you know it's, it's ironic that we often disparage the memories of goldfishes and the like when in fact they have superb memories <laughs> yeah i think they might be better at some things than we are <laughs> certainly i i, I am I, I can't they are better than that me. yeah <laughs> i can't find the remote to my tv most of the time <laughs> oh gosh yeah <laughs> my favorite is where are the glasses and they're on your head that's always a good one so, oh. <laughs> um, that's really interesting um so when we look at fish, um, even just individuals of the same species, I don't think we can probably tell individuals apart very easily, but fish can. Um, fish can tell each other apart, right? 
not only can they tell each other apart, but they can tell us apart, or at least mm -hmm. based on one published study with one species. Of course, we, we may we may extrapolate at our at our own peril, but <laughs> certainly archer fishes who are who are randomly picked for this type of thing, but except for the fact that they squirt water to try and catch flying insects, which itself is a fascinating behavior. Yes. Uh, but you know, the scientists thought of, they thought of well, let's present them with touch pads over there over the tanks so that they can we can present visual stimuli and they can learn to squirt water for instance you get a reward if you squirt water in a familiar human face and then they took digitized <laughs> images of human faces and you know typical scientific fashion presented them in random arrays and all this sorts of thing but what they concluded was that an archer fish definitely can recognize individual human faces and they look the faces look pretty similar to me in the study yeah. and they also artificially removed the ears removed the hair and still they could they would squirt water at the one familiar face among up to 40. So wow. that shows the yeah the visual acuity of a fish that of course uses vision a lot but not just vision visual acuity physically but the mental power to recognize uh, subtle differences in in appearance uh, and this wow. this is kind of supported by other studies that aren't weren't developed in that way but that have clearly shown that fishes must be identifying individuals to carry out their normal adaptive behaviors. Hmm. Wow. Amazing stuff. Yeah, the fish get more impressive the more we know about them, I think. <laughs> yeah. Um, one thing that you definitely spend some time talking about in the book is this idea that kind of people think that fish don't feel pain. It's kind of an odd thing to think. I'm not really sure why. I don't know. Maybe it's just a thought of convenience. Um, but in the event we need science to prove that they do feel pain, um, what would be some ways that indicate that? One way is to is to look at the anatomy and physiology, uh, and there, there's a book called "Do Fish Feel Do Fish Feel Pain." It was published in 2010, mm -hmm. I think it was. Victoria Braithwaite, a fish physiologist, um, and she describes detailed studies of, of heavily anesthetized uh, trout who had had their skin peeled off and then, and then electrodes attached to nervous tissue. Again, they were fully anesthetized, thank God, right. oh, and they yeah. were terminally anesthetized. They never woke up from these experiments. Um, and then they, they showed that the fishes, uh, these fishes have the same three types of nociceptors or pain receptors that we have. Uh, they're responsible, responsive to chemical, heat, and mechanical pain. Uh, we have that too. So there's sort of anatomical studies. They also did behavioral mm -hmm. ones that showed that the fishes um, responded very differently. They didn't return to feeding if, they, if their lips had been injected with acid, for instance. So sort of a nasty kind of insult to the system. And they, they behaved in a way consistent with uh, being able to feel pain. And mm -hmm. if you give them a, you give them morphine or some other painkiller, uh, they would return, re resume feeding sooner than if they weren't given that pain reversing drug. Um, I think the most compelling demonstrations were of, a, of the sort of where there's a study of, ra of rainbow, sorry, not rainbow, zebra, zebra fishes. Mm. Those who were injected with acid would swim to a part of their tank that was accessed through a ch small chamber, a separate chamber that they would normally avoid because it was brightly lit mm -hmm. um, and there no places to hide. They, they would avoid that. But but when the scientists drizzled, um, dripped lidocaine, a uh, painkiller into that part of the tank, the ones who had been injected by with acid, I presume that hurts for a while, would swim over there, get pain relief. The, one, the controls who were injected with saline, who were swimming among them, stayed on the other side. They stayed away because they didn't want to go to an area of the tank that they would normally avoid because it's bright and they don't feel mm -hmm. safe. They stayed where there's places to hide. So it shows not only that fish is to have the wherewithal to relieve pain, if it's a, if there's a method to re relieve pain available to them, but they'll actually pay a cost. They will go somewhere that mm -hmm. they would normally avoid because they're not they don't feel safe there. But hey, they're getting pain relief. You know, I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing it slightly, but I think that's a very very compelling and you know why again I'm glad I wasn't a fish in the study. It's a pretty elegant study designed to to show that these animals behaviorally, physiologically, uh, cognitively are experiencing a painful event. Yeah. So, all right, this, I, I don't, hmm. this is kind of a tricky one because I mean, we know, we know fish feel pain. We also know that mammals and other animals that we factory farm and use in our usual food system feel pain, yet it doesn't, seem like it's made a huge impact on a large number of people to know this. Um, you know, I feel like 
you know, we know this about mammals. Now we know this about fish. I'd like to think that this would initiate a change in our food system and what we choose to consume, but I'm not sure if it will. What, what do you think? Like, it, how do we kind of build empathy towards animals that are not very well known? Such an important question, you know, and I've scratched my head for decades having worked in animal protection and yeah. uh, all my life being somebody who cares deeply about all, all animals. Um, you know, I think advocacy benefits from uh, being diverse. So I think it's important to have many doors towards caring about animals to go through. Mm -hmm. So somebody might want to join, for instance, a, a, a humane society uh, that takes a fairly modest approach, uh, a pragmatic approach. Uh, and then someone else might want to go through the door that leads to, you know, uh, loud activism, you know, being protests on the street and this sort of thing. Yeah. Of course, one can debate ad, ad infinitum, what, what are the most effective means? But, you know, if somebody really wants to make a difference, there's certainly ways they can get involved, organizations like Ocean Geographic, and, and there's many uh, ocean habitat and, and marine habitat and fish advocacy organizations springing mm -hmm. up now. Uh, I also always include a personal changes and choices you know the, the there's a slide i often show in talks and it's a i ask audiences you know what do you think the most dangerous weapon in the world is and i show a picture of a table a table fork i could include chopsticks i suppose but but the point there is our food choices impact hugely other species and fishes are no, no exception it's estimated mm -hmm. that about 98 percent of all the animals humans kill are to be eaten it's you know for food right. and uh, we certainly do hoist out huge numbers of, of fishes from the oceans and from marine environments every year the estimates range from a few hundred billion to possibly well over a trillion uh, staggering numbers and so easy to forget that they're all individuals whose lives matter to them uh, right. so you know there's there's many there's many sort of ways of of looking at um, trying to help animals and uh, marine animals in their environments uh, but but there's certainly a lot one one can do individually and in groups mm -hmm. yeah I mean definitely a, a shift in our food systems could certainly be helpful um, I know it at, at, here at Ocean Geographic whenever we do um, expeditions on liveaboards uh, we request that they don't serve well that first of all that it's a vegetarian menu but primarily that they don't serve fish because you do run to run into this issue a lot of times where saying vegetarian is not quite enough because for some reason fish tend to be lumped into that um, yes right the last time I looked uh, fish is strange. not a vegetable but <laughs> this has always been perplexing to me and I'm like, I, I don't think that counts um anyway uh we've tried to kind of push the the idea that we're talking about sea life not seafood and mm. you know sometimes just those little kind of switches and the terms that we choose to use can kind of initiate a conversation that hopefully gets us somewhere Another, I think, powerful context for some people is to put it in sort of economic terms. Yeah. And that is, uh, I heard a speaker once who put it in these terms. I thought it was quite profound. He said, when you buy a product, you are telling the company that put the product there, do it again. You're, mm -hmm. you're asking them, you're supporting them, you're giving them their, your money. If you don't like what they're doing, if you don't like tr trawling, bottom trawling, you don't like right. uh, commercial fishing and large scale and what have you, there's a lot of things to choose from to not like. Yeah. Don't don't fund it. Don't give them your money. You know, yep. it's it's yep. and that that not only is a responsibility, but it's also very empowering to know that we can day to day, yes, every day of our lives make a difference in that. So I, I do I do think it's important that we think about it in those economic terms as well. Yeah, I do too, especially from a regulatory perspective, that can make a real difference down the road. <laughs> um, all right, to get away from some of the heavier stuff and uh, close out with some fun things, I think. Um, I have a personal soft spot for anadromous fish. So anything that has an incredible migratory pattern from being born in freshwater, migrating out to salt and coming back. Um, in the book, you kind of detail exactly how this works and how they do this. Please tell us again, because I'm just regularly blown away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm hardly an expert on fish navigation, but I, I of so course cool, did, did encounter some of the research on that. There was one study where they, um, they wanted to look at these, these, as you say, anadromous. And by the way, I always confuse the terms anadromous and catadromous. All it's the a time. catastrophe for me. <laughs> the ones, <laughs> the ones who spend part of their life history in the oceans and they return to their freshwater streams. These researchers, uh, a long-term study necessarily. They, they, they actually 
dripped uh, two different chemicals in two different nearby streams. Uh, maybe they were 50 yard m miles apart or something. And they dripped different chemicals, benign, but nevertheless, uh, very detectable chemicals at the time that the young fish were, and then, oh, and then they released young salmon into these, into mm -hmm. these streams. So the salmon presumably experienced and, and maybe imprinted might be the right word onto these different mm -hmm. odors, these different chemicals when they swam into the ocean, then they spent a year and a half in the ocean and they come back to breed. And then at that time, predicting when these fishes, which by the way, I believe were marked somehow for long-term marking. Yeah. Um, then they dripped the chemicals into the same streams again, five, five years later or a year and a half, I think it was. I actually looked up this today in my, in my book. Um, <laughs> and uh, sure enough, the, they, they, they didn't catch the other group's fish in the wrong stream. It was only the ones who were, who were sort yeah. of imprinted with that chemical that, that went up that stream. So, um, so a very clear illustration that they're using chemical signals. That doesn't mean that's the only thing they use. They may also use sure. celestial cues, geomagnetic cues when they're orienting from open ocean back towards the right part of the, the world. And then maybe then they start to detect the chemical gradient that they can mm -hmm. follow they got a higher concentration to, to get back up. So Amazing. yeah, pretty, a pretty impressive uh, chemosensory capacity there and navigation. Absolutely. I mean, when you think it, what a minuscule concentration that something like that would exist in and they yes, could still exactly. detect it just yeah that really amazes me every time <laughs> um all right so what are your favorite personal experiences with fishes <laughs> i had to share one for right from here from the, the bay of quinty about three years ago my my partner and i we were walking along the, the shore and and she noticed this it, it looked like a large amoeba about 20 feet away. It, this was a year of flooding. We get flooding years sometimes. And so we were, we had our galoshes, our rubber boots on. We were prepared. We're walking <laughs> on in the shallows and this black amoeba. And I, and I did a, I did a research paper in an, as an undergrad on this species, species. So I knew quickly what, what exactly what it was. And I was so thrilled. I'd never seen this before. I'd only read about it. This black amoeba, we decided to sort of get in its path and hopefully it would come towards us. And it did. This, this, and as they got closer, I, I could see that the amoeba resolved into about 500 baby uh -huh. uh, bowfin fishes, Amia calva, I think is the Latin cool. name, uh, the species I did this paper on. Um, so there's about 500 black little tadpole-like, if you like, uh, mm -hmm. fishes in this dense mass. You couldn't see through it. In fact, there's a big adult fish among them. This is the dad. This is a parental care fish. And it's the dads who does the, do the parental care. And this male was right in the midst of them. Sometimes he would disappear in the middle of this amoeba-like form. Anyway, they, they approached us and they got to our boots and they kind of morphed their way around our boots. I stuck my fingers in. I could feel these gelatinous feeling little soft body. It was just such a beautiful, thrilling experience. At one point, a, a little cluster of them, maybe 50 or so, broke off from the main mass and the male dutifully swam over and corralled them and, and guided them back to the main one. It was so so lovely to see that sort of caring, caring, noble behavior in a fish. And uh, so totally memorable experience right from my neighborhood where I live now. Uh, one other that's sort of maybe, uh, well, I guess one from, from snorkeling off the coast of Florida where I lived for a couple of years when I was working on this book. Um, I, th there were rocky shelves right offshore and, and, and I would it, shelves and rocky and structure is a big attraction to fish but you see them much more than if it's just open sandy areas so they would always be fish around there but one day i'm snorkeling there and i noticed a little fish swimming along right next to me right sort of like like a little pilot fish it wasn't that i don't know what species it was it was tiny it was kind of a green brown color cute little thing of course and uh, it swam next to me and i would turn away and you know look at other fish for a while and then i'd come back and there it still was and, and there would be periods where it would disappear and then there it was again anyway long story short I, I it was probably about 15 minutes before i decided it was time to get out and this little fish was still with me and, and it was I be, i'd become started to become a little attached to this fish and i have to admit i felt a little guilty getting out so i, I said goodbye to it but anyway you know who knows what's going on in that little fish's mind but it was clearly either intrigued or curious or felt safe around me i don't know i, I wouldn't feel safe around me but in any event it was a charming little encounter that is so neat. Yet yeah, some sometimes, gosh, some of the experiences we get to have in the ocean are just amazing. Um, it's funny about fish feeling safe around you. I was in uh, Magdalena Bay on the um, Pacific side of Baja um, for 
well, they're calling it the Pacific sardine run lately, but it's uh, just September, well, actually uh, November, when all the sardines kind of come down along the coast and all the uh, swordfish and the marlin come there to eat them. Uh, and uh, if you're in the water with a large school of sardines and there's nothing else around them for cover, they will definitely use the snorkeler as cover, <laughs> which is Neat. a very um, sort of scary thing to have happen <laughs> because marlin are moving very quickly. Oh, and um, right. if you're imagining that they might not see you, <laughs> Yeah, in that school of sardines you're meant to kind of keep away from the bait fish um but they follow and uh, so, will definitely try to school around you and just use your food protection so go and go and get her she's a bigger food exactly item. that's the big fish hang out with that one <laughs> are there any documented cases of being people being injured this way not that I know of. I mean, marlin are incredibly good at detecting uh, at essentially everything around them all at once. And they're so fast. And this is how they're used to navigating. But as a person, it seems impossible sure. that anything could navigate that quickly and not hit you. But as far as I know, I don't think there have been incidents yet. Um, I, I feel like there might have been one close call where maybe the sword part of the marlin kind of like went through somebody's BCD, like through the armhole, didn't Scary. get the person, but like it just because a fish was going under it or something and just right, right. under. Mm -hmm. um, but they're just spatially insanely aware. I just and the speeds that they move at, it seems impossible that they can do that. But again, fish being, you know, smarter for their environment than people would be. <laughs> I was fascinated to learn that marlins and swordfish, uh, they, they're the powerful muscles that they have actually can be used to heat up their eyes and their vision is, is much more, more acute uh, when they're heated up that way. Very interesting adaptation. It, well, and it makes a lot of sense when you see how fast they move. I mean, you would need as much sharpness as possible yeah. with movements like that. So um, yeah, amazing precision, but plenty of stories to be had out in the ocean, I yeah. suppose. Yeah, indeed. Well, I think that's probably about it for now. Um, thank you so much for joining us for a chat. This was fantastic. Can't think of something better for Oceans Week. And, a real um, pleasure, Alex. Thanks for interviewing me. It's fun to talk about fish. It never gets old. It really doesn't. <laughs> well, thanks very much. And hopefully we will hear from you soon. For Again, for anyone who wants to check it out, what a fish knows, definitely check it out. All right. Happy Oceans Week, everyone. Thank you again. Thanks.